first smoke family, you're in for a tree. I promise you, we got one of the largest smugglers in US history. 660,000 pounds of cannabis smuggled into the US. $68 million in profits. This guy was a NASCAR driver, Indy 500 car driver, rookie of the year. He's top smuggler of the year in my book. This guy's the man. You're in for a treat. First Smoke family, pay attention to this one. First Smoke family, listen, we got a special episode today. Let me just tell you this. According to the FBI, our next guest that we have on right now smuggled over 660,000 pounds of cannabis into the U.S., $68 million in profit, 300 tons. The documentary on Netflix was mind-blowing. The amounts were mind-blowing. <laughs> when I try to explain to people the size of the ships, the cargo containers, the story, it's almost like it's written not real, right? It's like, this can't be true. When you hear the amounts, welcome Randy Lanier to the podcast. First smoke Thank of you. the day. Thank you. Let's start off with this. It starts in uh, Lynchburg, Virginia. Yep. That's where I was born. Yeah. Right? Lynchburg, Virginia. The weed didn't start until... I was moved to Florida, but uh, mm -hmm. Lynchburg, Virginia was where I was born. And the racing kind of, uh, as a young child, I got hooked up on listening to racing on AM radio. Mm -hmm. And kind of the racing bug hit me at a young age. I didn't know it until I was in my 20s. And then, I mean, so you grow up there and then well, why move to Miami? Why move to South Florida? Well, that was my parents thing. Uh, when I was a teenager, my dad, uh, kind of an alcoholic a little bit. and. Kind of got in a car and sold the house, auctioned the house off and moved us to Florida. <laughs> so I found myself in Florida at the beaches, uh, smoking weed at 14 and loving life. And, you know, it's a whole nother way of living the culture mm -hmm. that I grew up with uh, from there versus uh, in the tobacco fields of Virginia in the 50s. I mean, in Virginia, their stance on cannabis is way different than Florida at that time, too, probably. Oh, well, absolutely. Yeah, it's. And it's, it's, it's sad that the stigma's on this plant that's still going on to this day. It just blows my mind that so many people, generations still think that this plant, uh, it, it's not what it is, they, they think. So it's a plant that heals. It's like a fake bill of goods. It's like, uh, this is what it, you've been told it is, and it's something very different. And the yeah. people who are behind it are something very different, too. They're not gun tote and felons who you know want hardened criminal it's crazy when you watch the documentary and you see how much got done and how much work happened and it was like friends yeah it was all my friends we didn't carry weapons we just smoked weed and brought we tons of weed into the country <laughs> well let's let's start into that i mean wherever you want to enter into when you get to florida i see it starts with just smoking it what was the first when's the first time you start to smoke weed ever I was 14 years old, so oh. um, started smoking, found a way that I could sell it and smoke for free. I mean, I think there's thousands of people that live the same thing because it kind of with the demand that is popular, and you can smoke the weed and sell it and smoke for free. I wasn't interested in the profits at the time. That came on later. Yeah, it did. I mean, and... And you, you went bigger than anyone I've ever heard. Like when I, when I try to fathom the, the size, I got so many questions in my mind about how you go from that to where we start hearing about hundreds of thousands of pounds, you know, and where does it start? How, how does it start where you start to smoke it? And then you're like, yeah, I'll get some for free. And then it goes from a pound here and there to like, we should go to Mexico. <laughs> I remember I saw that. I was well, like, holy I, shit. I didn't, I didn't bring no Mexican weed in. I brought oh, all okay. Colombian all weed Columbians. in. All Colombian. Yes. Okay. Uh, they, they figured out to only ship in the, the top buds, no, no mids. <laughs> so all the weed that I brought in was all Punta Roja red buds and, and a lot of Santa Marta gold. And uh, we take whole mountainsides. And it's an amazing thing. I, now, that was some of the questions I had too was like, 
man, to acquire that much. So when you get to Miami and you guys start to make these first loads, uh, one of the questions is like, how do you acquire? I think the first one was like, well, 40 or 60,000 pounds, 60,000. My, my first load was 15,000 pounds. 15,000 pounds. Yeah. How do you even acquire? Do you go down and talk to one grower? Or are you talking to multiple I growers? I went down and I talked to two families, ended up picking one. So it was a, a process that I just had to go through and I wanted to get the best weed I could get. And when I found the ones that had the best weed, that's what we decided to bring in. Wow. And so you even had a choice with that much. I was thinking you'd have to clear out the whole town. It wasn't like that at all. Well, the towns that kind of supply the workers are away from the mountains where they grow. So by the loads that we ended up doing, yeah, we, we kind of really help the the whole towns come up in the world yeah it's crazy i mean probably for that much production of cannabis to think like fifteen thousand pounds i mean that that's crazy that that's half the you know that's a lot of people working that side that that whole operation yeah actually that's not a not a whole lot of weed for what's grown down there back in the 80s and the 70s they was growing a lot so there was multiple smugglers bringing in good sized loads. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd, I'd be in a bay down there when I first started bringing in loads and there'd be all the ships coming in wanting to use the bay that we're at. So uh, it was a lot of families growing weed. Were a lot of the guys that you ran into from South Florida when you would yes. run it? Yeah, it yes. seems like that, doesn't it? Well, it was the East Coast. That's an easy trip from Columbia to Florida. Yeah. It makes sense too. And a couple so, times I had to bring it through Panama Canal and bring it up to the West Coast. Wow. Um, I saw, I mean, we'll get into that. Yeah, we'll get into the, that. Yeah. We're <laughs> yeah. going to get into that. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, first load's 15,000 pounds. And can you kind of run through, run through that trip for me of like, let's decide to go down to actually doing it? Just like give so it. So the first load, I went down there with a deposit to, to give the Colombians for a load. And I'd already met them in discuss some details, but I only wanted really good weed. So I went and looked at the first crop that we wanted to bring in. I wanted to make sure I wasn't getting, you know, mids mm -hmm. and um, really got some good weed. I sent a 68 footer down to a bay and they got these cayucas. They're, they're like 40 foot trees that's cut out with machetes. And it's, it's got a little single diesel in the back of it, a little plank and a single diesel with a guy out there. And the whole time he's taking uh, like a coffee can and he's pouring the water out because the water's about past your ankles. And, the, and you're thinking, man, are we going to make it to the shore? And these are what they're hauling the weed in now. When they bring the weed from the mountains to the beach, this is what they're making the weed, to, how they're getting it into our vessel on Cayucas. Pretty amazing. And to see it. It's like ants everywhere, but, but they're cayucas. And, uh, and they're all moving cannabis. All moving cannabis. Wow. Yeah, Most of trip. the same strain too. Or in, just in that, in, if it's out of that bay, yeah. Because there's a lot of bays. There's different, different families that are, are smuggling weed. And then, so now you're headed back, right? When does the, does it, is it the whole time you're nervous about, you know, okay, Coast Guard, okay, here we, or is it right when you start to get closer to land, you're like, all right, here we go. So on those loads, mm -hmm. I stayed on the shore in Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> Hell yeah. I love hearing that. I had a clue that. with that, uh, oh. bringing that in. Mm -hmm. So doing 12 knots, it takes, takes a couple of weeks to get, get back from Columbia to South Florida, where I was located at first. Mm -hmm. And it was a pretty amazing thing to do because we did what we call a beach assault. We ran Zodiacs in all night. I had this idea to to take the Zodiacs like the Navy SEALs use, load it up with weed, have a mothership about a half a mile off of my house and run weed in all night. And uh, it worked out. I saw that in, in the docu-series, they were saying a couple came walking down with a cigarette and everything had to stop for a second because they were just walking down the beach while you guys are literally running loads in yeah, and that, then back to work as soon as they walk back. Yeah, I, w <laughs> I was concerned about the beach walkers and- yeah. To see what's going on with an operation like that, everybody's dressed in black and um, we're hauling weed all night. But the first trip, it almost didn't work out because I leave the house early and I get a phone call telling me, hey, you got about a thousand pounds still on the beach and the sun's coming up and I'm on, my sta I'm on my way to my stash house. So luckily I had some people in a hotel with vans that could shoot down there and help them get it to the beach. 
holy shit, a thousand pounds just sitting. And, and I mean, so everyone scrambles, gets it in. And then what is it? Uh, is it, celebra- it goes to stash houses? Yeah. Is it a it, celebration though for you? Are you like, we made it yet? Or is it back to work? Well, it's a celebration, but not right away. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, sell it. It's yeah. sold right away. It's, it's sold the next day. So wholesale, it, yeah. it's gone. Probably took two days to get it out of the house. Ooh. It'd take that long just to load it up. That's wild. And so then first load goes through, is everyone saying this is some of the best weed that we've had? What's up with some more of it? <laughs> yeah, the demand for good weed is outstanding. That's why you see 37 states right now with it legal in some form or fashion, medical or recreation, because mm-hmm. people's getting educated. This plant heals you in many ways. So it creates balance in, in everybody. And that's why I think uh, education is important and uh, it, it, it's going to continue to grow. All that- these states will be legal eventually. I love that. It creates balance. I like that. That's a great way to put it. It definitely does. Um, and at this time, that first load comes in. You're already racing cars. You got the Porsche at that time? I started racing uh, in the late 70s. Mm-hmm. And I had already started doing little small loads from the Bahamas. I hadn't got to the bigger ships. I'm racing. I'm bringing loads in, a, in like a Magnum and a cigarette. They go fast boats. So that's how I originally started was doing the loads uh, through the Bahamas in 28, 36-foot cigarettes. And you would just load it in every compartment where they would either put fish or any storage, or is it on the boat? Like no, a- all inside the hull. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, so it's somewhat hidden. It's inside of a hull of a Damn. boat. Damn. Yeah. Wow. So that's, even a, that's a whole other process, too, on its own, uh-huh. is trying to, once you acquire it, you got to spend money trying to get it put together now so you can get it back. Like having to, you'd have to open the hole up of the boat and then reattach it? Well, the boats are built. You just gut the inside and you just stuff weed in it. Got it. Okay. Damn. That's awesome. (laughs) You ever, uh, any of those first couple trips, any close calls with Coast Guards, anything like that? that Yeah, I had a couple of them. Um, Every time you do a load, you have to improvise. Something doesn't go right. Something breaks down. I've I've been stuck off an island uh, off off of Bimini, about 18 miles north of Bimini. Uh, at a, an abandoned lighthouse, storming all night in a tropical depression. We can't cross the Gulf Stream, and a helicopter comes over the next day and sees us. And it's raining, and it's windy, and I, we're out in, fr- in, the, in the cockpit of the boat. And you think, and we, we then got an anchor on the leeward side of the island, and here comes the helicopter Coast Guard, and they must be thinking, why the hell are they outside in the rain? <laughs> <laughs> We're good. You know, I appreciate yeah, Give them a thumbs good. up. But not only that, they can look at, <laughs> look at the level of the water and they can see that the boat's setting low. Ooh. So we know, they know that we're there loaded. So oh, damn. I get paranoid. We pull anchor and we head to Bimini. And middle of the storm. Middle of the storm. I get there to the docks, we tie off, and I go get like a, a Coke case full of water and conch fritters and stuff for us, the sodas and stuff, because we didn't use everything else we got, and we're all outside the cockpit of the boat, and as I get to the docks with all the food, here comes a helicopter, the same one that had spotted me behind the island, and now they hover really low. They hover so low that the water in the... Uh, in the bay is all churned, churned up from their propellers. And uh, I said, just wave to them. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm thinking, oh, God, the, the Bahamian police are going to want to clear, clear customs and ask us. So we ended up going to another part of the island. And, and that night we took all the weed out and hid it into the pine trees and thinking that they was going to come and, and get us. But they didn't. We ended up getting the load in. Better safe than sorry, though. God, yes. God forbid yeah. they would have pulled in and you'd have found nothing. It would have been like, woo. But so, so a couple of close calls and you're just like, all right, so 15,000, when does it start to step up to the next process where you're like, all right, let's, let's go down to Columbia. And how do you QC the product? How do you quality control that much weed, right? Is it just one family and they know not to make a third of the shipment, just trash or yeah, tra- you know it's how's the business look, i got it on the front mm. and i've told them you know we we don't want shitty weed mm. now it's got to be all tops so they gave us all tops i love that i love good business 
even back then. I mean, on the front and then, and then, and then it keeps a very honest, uh, he's got to sell it. It's got to do well. Then we'll get our money. You know what I'm saying? So it keeps everything very forward. I like that. Uh, how do you meet that first plug in Columbia? You've obviously say you talk to somebody when you go down there, is it very, is it very straightforward or is it a whole process a week or two down there? Three weeks, like one week, my first time I went down there. Holy shit. One week and you got all that done. I mean, that's incredible. Yeah. Let's roll up. Yeah. I mean, I was nervous about, uh, I didn't know if you were going to be smoking or how, you know, you know, you just never know with certain guests like, yo, how are they, do they really smoke like that? Or man, I love to see you pulled up with your, with some fire weed and smoking. Like that's, that's my good friend, Stephanie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's awesome, man. Sticky OG for everyone, you know, who, who doesn't know that's some sticky OG right there. Yeah. So, I mean, let's get into it as far as you go down to Columbia, you start to buy these larger loads. Uh, how do you make, like, how do you talk the guy who's going to be carrying that into obviously money, but how do you even find the guy that's like, Hey man, cause you would think like, okay, I'm going to go approach this guy who, who runs a, a shipment, right? A shipper. Uh, and what if I approach him wrong and now he calls the cops on me? You know what I'm saying? Like, so I started smuggling when I was 19 years old. So from bringing other smugglers loads in, I wasn't going to get it. I was going to the Bahamas and bringing, I had a 30, I had a 28 foot cigarette and I would bring other smugglers weeds in. So I got connections from my, my guys that I was working for from the Bahamas that introduced me to some Colombians. And then I had a partner that went to the joint and um, he, he had somebody that had a good connection and it just went from there. Know, when you grow up around the culture, you know, you just meet people and mm -hmm. you know, so um, all the loads I was bringing in on my cigarettes, I had multiple guys saying, Hey, well get the weed from my guys. You know? So that's how it's easy. If you, if you grow up in that type of environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and did you see like now season to season, you ever have a drought? You ever not able to get that much product? Cause I mean, your, your loads just went bigger and bigger. I never had, I could get weed two or three times a year. Okay. And but you knew already, like, here's, what, here's when it's going out. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, it was, I mean, as soon as I unload the weed and sell it, I'd send the boat back down there. Damn. The bigger the, the loads I started getting took longer times to put together. Mm -hmm. it, you know, one load could take almost a year and organizing it and kind of all the logistics and the warehouses and the offloading operations. And yeah, it, it, it got kind of complicated. I saw that and then your network has to get bigger too. Cause how do you trust that many people? You know, I kept my distributors down to three to four people. That's how. Damn. Thought out. Uh, how about when, I mean, even your crew on the other side, how, once you start to have to expand, is it all like family friends? Like as far as, Hey, you got a brother that wants to help us out. How do you find more people local without? Well, the distributors have to find that, not me. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I keep, I kept myself. Um, just distance from right. Yeah. yeah. Damn. And and most of the time you racing this whole time or the you whole time I'm racing. Yeah. yeah. And then it was Crazy. paying all the, the bills for the racing. So, um, kind of was a rookie of the year, rookie of the year in 1986. B yeah. Andretti. Or that what was, was, yeah. Qualified as a rookie and broke Michael Andretti's record that had been standing for three years. So, uh, that was good. But at the same time, that month, the whole month of May in 1986 was the month of Indianapolis 500. And I've got the FBI following me, the DEA following me. I got a load that's on the water at the time. And um, it, was, it was kind of bizarre. <laughs> I saw that part. It was insane. I mean, that, that, and it, it went like, you know, what, 60,000, 100,000 pounds. I mean, that much product. It, it, I can't, but it's so crazy to think that it was coming from, uh, it, it was easy to acquire because you wouldn't think that. I mean, that's a ton of weed, even these days. I mean, that's crazy. Uh, is it loaded in shipping containers? How do you start to hide that much? No, I, I put it in the ballast. In the ballast uh, of the boat. 300 foot barge. That carries salt water as ballast, but we made it's a six-story barge, so half of it we put steel in the center, 
and used a fake compartment on the bottom and put salt water on the top. Damn. And, and do you know the capacity or does it have to keep expanding? Like you knew what the maximum could be. It was just how much money can we get together to keep moving? You know, because you, you got six stories well, to fill if you need to, right? I put the capacity in what I knew I could sell like overnight. Mm. You know, so I, well, it's not setting in warehouses. So um, as soon as I got it, it was already shipped out and sold. Damn. You, uh, random question. You ever keep any seeds from back in the day? No, I wish I, oh I, wish I had. Oh. When I saw that man <laughs> documentary, all I thought was, man, those seeds today, people would be yeah. clamoring over those. Yeah, I like to do some strains here. I'm looking at the, some land-raised Colombian strains now that um, we're going to bring to the market. Yeah, you said your partner didn't grow and how crazy it is to go from you know, I mean, you had life in prison and we'll get into that where they gave you life in prison without parole and now to actually have a cultivation license. Yeah, it's bizarre. It's really ironic that, that now that's how it is with the, the stigma that this plant's got. Back in the 80s, they was giving out life sentences. And this is, in my case, I, they had no weed. I got a dry case. They hadn't found one seed in my case. Not one bud ever got arrested transferred to an agent they all got smoked so when i took my case to trial uh, which was a three-month trial it was bizarre because it's all hearsay conspiracy and I, it is what it is i brought all the weed in but still it doesn't deserve a life sentence and i'm not sit sitting here crying about it because mm -hmm. it's probably what i needed at the time because it's what happened to me all right so to say that is a lot of times we have to go through struggles and hardships to get to where we need to be, to be of service to others and stuff like that. So it's, it's pretty, pretty bizarre when you look at it in a, a more um, profound way. It is weird like that. And energy in the world works weird like that. When you, like you say, be of service. Uh, one of the things we thought was real cool is we actually had watched the Netflix series, uh, your Netflix documentary, right? The night before we're in NorCal, we're all talking. The next morning we wake up and we had a message with you that came in and we were like blown away. We were all like, we oh, wow. just talked about this yeah. eight hours ago watching yeah. this documentary. Yeah. And this, it just was like, oh, we're moving in the right direction. This is, yeah. this is a sign, so, you know? So, so that's how manifesting works. All right. So when you're really having good intentions and you're doing it from your heart, it brings about abundance uh, in many ways, abundance of the right people in your life at the right time, the right thing to happen, the right opportunity. That's how abundance comes about, but it comes from about more than that, though, is when you're really grateful for what it is you're into and doing. Little things. Oh, you just found a really, might not have really great weed. Now you got a nice nugget, man. Someone didn't gave you, oh, man, life's good, man. <laughs> you know? Hell yeah. It's Being so grateful, true. That's the foundation of it. Damn, I, I love that. I, and it's so true. Anybody who's had stuff like that happen in their lives and they have that affirmation. You're manifesting just like mm -hmm. that with the, the talking and stuff. And you mm -hmm. guys got some good intentions of doing good mm -hmm. things. So boom, bam, we're here talking about the podcast. I mean, we to be honest, low key, we look up to guys like you, man. I mean- if I was born in a different time, I think uh, I think I, I would have been right there next to you trying to get involved. I absolutely love what you do, man. I, I love the documentary. I loved how positive it was Thanks. for cannabis, yeah. right? It's like you see stuff like that, and a lot of times it feels like hard and dark. Yeah. It didn't feel like that. Well, You're watching the show. That's the nature of the plant. Oh, everything around it, it, it people that you know mm -hmm. that, that really love the plant, uh, love life. and. I tell my friends and stuff, look, we want to live a life of wonderment every day. Because I was just talking to one of my friends this morning about it. When you're living in wonderment, you're living more mindful right in the moment. And life is a good thing. And that's what this plant does. It's mm -hmm. amazing. It draws people, attracts people to each other. It, it's an amazing plant. It is. And it, like you said, it brings amazing people together. That's why we're here. And to see where it took your life and how you were able to accomplish other dreams with it too, right? It wasn't just, I smuggle weed for a living. The, the top of it is that you're one of the, I mean, you're a great race car driver. 
I mean, it just the documentary just showed that to, to have uh, no you. backing like some of these other guys had that not have the corporate sponsors like some poor, you know, it was crazy to see how the amount of money behind other cars and then to see that you funded yourself. So part of the whole ironic full circle of life is I made a ton of million, a ton of money, mm -hmm. hundred million dollars. And by the time I get pinched, I wasn't doing the things I could have been doing. Now I come out after 27 years and they give me a license to grow weed. So this time oh, I find things that I can do to be of service. And that's what I'm trying to get at. I mean, we all have this amazing powers in, inside of us to be aware of what we can do for others and help others. And so, and this plant here, I do 27 years and they give me a license and say, hey, grow all the weed you can grow. So now with Freedom Grow, this is why I'm wearing this shirt. Mm -hmm. We help cannabis prisoners. And I got to tell you, it's an amazing thing when you really are uh, sincerely about uh, helping others. And that's why we're here. About so when I was racing and, and making all this ton of money, I could have been doing a whole lot more bigger things is what I'm getting at. So living in wonderment at the same time, you can manifest and stuff, but do something that's right that is bringing it to you. Do something that's good. Damn, that's a great way to put I mean, yeah, a hundred percent. Uh with that, I mean, you're literally taking calls in the parking lot when you pulled up from a prisoner. Yeah, I get them um pretty much during the week. And they call you just <laughs> to talk, right? Yeah, I got some friends that are still in there. I got friends that um that um, you know, you get good bonds with mm -hmm. people when you do a lot of time, walk the yard. And um, yeah. 27 years a lot. I mean, even when we brought up some of the books here that are in the background, I'm sure a lot of people pass over when they're watching the podcast, but we talked about Saltwater Cowboy, Black Tuna. I mean, you started going about Howard Marks. Yeah, I used to play tennis with him. at uh, We had a tennis court in Terre Haute, Indiana. So we used to hit the ball together a lot and walk the yard. That's Mr. Nice for people that don't understand <laughs> who that is. That's, yeah. I mean, wow. What a, yeah. Read that book. Yo, what up? It's Blackleaf. I'm here at Grow Generation. And guess what? Drip Hydro storming the market. All the best growers I know are switching to it. And guess what? There's a reason. Because it's preserving terps. I keep hearing that. Preserving terps. And that's why we're here with Sunshine. Facility advisor, facility manager, overall the man with Drip Hydro. Listen to why it's different, man. What's going on, guys? Sunny here with Drip Hydro. Thing is, at the end of the day, we just wanted to make a simple, clean, cost-effective nutrient line that nobody has really seen on the market right now. Nobody uses really our chelation formulas, uh, the micronutrients that we have pulled to make this line is really just what makes it overall bringing that consistency and quality back to what we want to see in growing herb again and overall at the end of the day it's still really light on your wallet it's a five-part nutrient line and again if you're not staying sterile or you have a big facility and you don't want to run rock wool and you want to run a mix of cocoa with an enzyme or something you don't even have to run flow with it so at the end of the day it's just saving you money on your wallet while bringing the consistency and the quality of terps back we wanted to bring the terps back and bring the soul back to growing versatility cost effective and quality i mean what else can you ask for drip hydro first smoke of the day black leaf approved peace damn this place is huge i gotta get what i need and get out of here man i'm in a rush what whoa black leaf oh you already what know what you doing here i basically live here grow generation can filters power si athena products lux lighting man i mean i basically live here grow generation store is the largest hydroponic store i've ever been to it's crazy the largest hydroponic retailer in the nation with over 60 locations so you know they got one near you it's growgeneration.com and at grow generation on instagram tell them first smoke of the day sent you and what were some of the other ones you recognized? Um, Black Tuna, Bobby Platform. I was a, a cellmate with him in uh, Atlanta Penitentiary when they first captured me uh, in the islands. Damn, the Black Tuna Diaries. Yeah. I mean, crazy. I mean, and Cornbread, and Cornbread Mafia. Cornbread Mafia was one of the guys that was involved with that, was uh, a buddy of mine who was a cellmate for a a little under a year till I got I got caught up in an escape investigation and <laughs> sent to another to Leavenworth Penitentiary. Ooh, that's um, a hard one too, huh? Yeah, they think you're trying to get out. They kind of lock you out, and next thing you know, you you're in the in the bucket for a couple of years, and 
go, damn, does time really exist? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a kind of really changes your perspective because uh, solitary confinement does that. It, it gives you time to contemplate and think. And like I said, sometimes though, in these struggles and these hardships that you think you might be going through, there's a blessing in there. You just have to look for it. And that's one thing about being resilient with we all have. We're all resilient in many ways, but resiliency is not just getting through something, though. It's when you do things and you go through a hardship or a struggle and you turn that hardship or struggle into something positive, that's true resilience. And that's what we're here now doing at Freedom Grow. And if you haven't checked us out, check us out. It's a nonprofit organization that here to help support cannabis prisoners. I mean, doing positive stuff, that's huge. Giving back. Uh, when... Let's I just want to jump back into the story a little bit. So when the FBI is investigating you and they're flying over, right? If no one would have snitched on you, you think you would have walked from that? Or do you think they had? Look, here's the thing. If everybody just shuts the fuck up, they ain't going to know no more <laughs> uh -huh. than that. So yeah, if, if you just shut the fuck up, it's not going to lead into other people. But that's not how they were carrying it. So yeah, and that's what usually <laughs> happens. I mean, a big group of people they lean, and not everyone has the same. You know, I mean, it's tough. Le the leather is is a different leather on everybody. You know, um, when this starts to unfold, how many shipments are you already? How many years of of shipping at this point? Well, I started smuggling when I was nineteen, mm -hmm. so I didn't start doing the large loads until nineteen eighty two. In 1986, I was being investigated, and I had a load out on the water, and that was my last load. So, and that was four years of really large loads. Mm -hmm. And that was supposed to go into South Florida and had to be redirected, or Louisiana, Louisiana, and had to be redirected yeah. to NorCal. Yeah. And it took six months from Louisiana to NorCal because you had to go through the Panama Canal. Right. Yeah. Long journey. That's yeah. wild. Yeah, I'm thinking, man, this weed's going to be shitty when I get it here. <laughs> <laughs> People don't even understand what it took uh, to get weed. But you know what? Weed. It was still pretty good. Really? It was still not nice. Yeah. Wow. And so, I mean, how long would, if it's six months extra, how long did that weed spend in that, in that ship? Total. Um, six and a half months. Wow. But seven months, right at seven months. Yeah. That's a lot of work to, I mean, people didn't even know they're buying a little sack back in the day or an ounce, you know, four finger, whatever flat. And there, and you just don't know what it took to get that here, you know, yeah. <laughs> crazy. And so that last shipment, the ballast broke. And so you lose half the load. No. More than I, half. One container of it. Oh, okay. Right. So it wasn't Each that. compartment held about 20 to 24,000 pounds. Damn. The guy who's driving that boat, that you got to have to also have some brass to to want to do that cuz that's a no matter what that guy's also going down. You know, you if he could call. talk about captain. Yeah. So we would take the boat after I load it and and seal it up and put cement or Brazilian wood in it. And then we would tow it to Santo Domingo. And my crew would get off and we'd hire a crew that didn't know it was on there. So the people that brought the weed in actually didn't know they was bringing weed in. That's the best way to do it. Yeah, that's, I used to hear that. Uh, man, that's wild. So everything starts to unfold. And uh, I saw some money got buried, some money got put in places and then ended up getting told on and getting, <laughs> that's how, that's how they found it. <laughs> Uh, which was yeah, crazy. Yeah. Uh, and then they give you life in prison without parole. Natural death. No. Yeah. Oh, man. And what are you thinking at that time when that happens? Are you, are you thinking, okay, well, that's that then? Um, at first, it was, it's devastating. You mm -hmm. know, I'm, 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 I'm crushed. I'm going to the penitentiary for life. But at 33 years old and kind of successful, I was kind of, full of myself. And I figured if the courts don't get myself out, I'll get myself out. And I commenced on that path um, of trying to figure out ways to get myself out of prison through the legal system mm -hmm. and through maybe devices of my own. Okay. 
And I mean, bef- even right before that, right, when you had fleed, you, you go down and I remember seeing the part where you're going into a diner to grab some food and you see on the TV that they're looking for you. Is that how you found out that they were actually looking for you? Was Well, I had already been indicted on another smuggling case. And I was out on bond. So I had moved out of my house and got an apartment and I seen it on the, the diner TV. And that was my, the case that got me to life sentence. And so then you go down to Antigua? I had a house down in Antigua yeah. and, and a boat. Yeah. So I first went to Europe and stayed there for a while and take, took care of some business and then flew to Antigua where my vessel was. Do you think if you would have stayed in Europe, they would have got you there? Um, who knows, right? Yeah, never yeah. thought about it. Really. I, just want, I mean, it did come across my mind that, damn, I should have stayed over in Switzerland. <laughs> But uh, I had unfinished business. Mm-hmm. I because I I was blown away. I'm like, they found him in Antigua because I'm I, you know that's just and then they show the plane flying over multiple times and then you you took off and they they ended up getting you. Um, that's that's got to be just heartbreaking because you you think like I think I'm gonna be all right, and then it's like oh shit, they did get me. Yeah, I think they had they knew I had a vessel. And they had two agents, they hired FBI agents that every day, five days a week, they would look for my vessel. And just happened to be the day that I was on it, they happened to fly over it. And um, it was the end of the story. Damn, they spent a lot of money trying to find you. That's, to sit there and five days a week fly over vessels to try to find for which- For about nine months it took. Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> Hell Yeah. But uh, I had a grand plan. I was going to take the vet, vet, it was a 60 foot hydro, so I was going to take it to the south of France and then take it to um, Costa del Sol in Spain. That's my grand plan. But I ended up going to the island and getting pinched. When you get to court and you're going through all that, and obviously one of your friends ended up taking the stand against you, was it just one person or was it multiple? No, <laughs> I had two dozen of them. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> that many people showed up to just say, hey, well, it was 64 witnesses and 24 were government collaborators that out of that, 24, maybe um, eight of them had actual knowledge of what I was doing. Oh, wow. So a lot of hearsay. A lot of hearsay. Damn. And that's so crazy. No, to- no, they found no weed. It was a dry case. It's insane to think that, that they could put you away for life based on hearsay with no weed and just people telling you about a story about, yeah, I, I did that with him. But, but put you to life for a flower. That, yeah. That, I mean, what's justice in that? It's not justice. That's, it's some weird thinking. Yeah, it is. And it's coming about, though. Think, change is coming, but it's still happening. I mean, we have someone that's in prison right now. He got a 10-year sentence. He got a dispensary. They raided him and they charged him the same charge I had running a criminal enterprise because it's a scheduled one narcotic. So with that, if you have a dispensary and you got a manager and three bud tenders, it's a criminal enterprise because it's a scheduled one narcotic. And you're the manager, supervisor, director, or organizer of three or more people, the bud tender and the, and the, and the manager. So uh, we have uh, Lance is still in. That's his name, Lance, and he's still in. I think he's done about seven years out of a 10-year sentence. Oh, wow. They're taking him the full 10 almost. Wow. Damn, man. Over being a manager at a, or an owner of a store. Yeah. It's sad. It's, it's weird how they start to just pick and choose people, even in some legal spots. When you got out, what was that like? What was that when you start to realize like I, I'm they're going to, you know, President Obama pardoned you? Well, th- that's not completely right. Oh, OK. I didn't get a pardon. Oh, OK. So you heard that on Netflix. Yeah, I did. I, I'm not pardoned. Damn Netflix. So, well. <laughs> you, you got me. I'm sitting here taking Pam, notes, man. Pam, Come I on asked now. Pam why she said this. She said, I don't know. I was nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't get a pardon. All right. I had like a perfect storm happening. President Obama had sent a directive down to the Justice Department to look at long, lengthy prison sentences of nonviolent criminals. I fell into that category. Mm -hmm. 
But then on the other hand, several years prior to him saying, doing, giving that, direct, uh, that directive of look at long, lengthy prison sentences of nonviolent prisoners, I had come to my attention that this casino I had built out here in California had been seized and some irregulatory things was going on with it with, through the U.S. Justice Department, through the U.S. Marshal Service. They had kept the casino for three years before they sold it. And then when they sold it, they didn't bet the buyer and they sold it to organized crime. <laughs> so ran so it for three years. They ran for three years. Collected the profits. They're, they're allowed to manage drug-related properties. Holy hell. All right. So, but they sold it and they didn't, they didn't vet the buyer. They, it was an organized crime, an Asian organized crime family, but they kept a percentages of the profits for nine years, U.S. Marshals. That's so insane. we started developing a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. At the same time, Obama had put in this directive to look at nonviolent cannabis prisoners or prisoners in general that are serving long, lengthy prison sentences. So it took me seven years to go through the courts with that. And then Obama issues this directive. And, and it was like a perfect storm. So, and, and so your lawyer comes to you or you, you hear about it? How do you start to realize like- I get a, I get a legal mail one day and it was a, my attorney and, and it is a motion from a U.S. district uh, attorney filing a motion to extend my forfeiture for f 20 more years, meaning they could seize any of my- assets for 40 years. It's never happened. This will be the first case. So we file for discovery. And about three months later, we get a Senate investigative report concerning the handling of the casino here in Gardenia, California called the Bicycle Club. Jeez, man. I mean, a lot of interesting questions in there. That's crazy. <laughs> that's like, I mean, that's a yeah. whole other chapter yeah. that they, I mean, that's a second, yeah. a second Netflix I didn't put it series. In this book. It'll be in the next book. Yeah, I was about to say, uh, they didn't put that well, in. That's a whole book, other. When I wrote the book, Survival of the Fastest, my originally was going to be 1,100 pages. Lots of stories. But the publishing house decided they wanted a quick read of 90,000 words, which it ended up being the right call because it's a quick read. And the reviews I'm getting is just like crazy good, man. And I just sold it for a movie. I mean, that's just mind blowing. So, you know, um, it, it just amaze, amazes me how we can manifest whatever it is, as mm -hmm. I was mentioned earlier. And it's, a, it's amazing because now I'm, I find myself out here helping cannabis prisoners. I mean, I had a natural death sentence, you know. I was just involved with helping myself in there and figured out, you know what, if this is where I'm at the rest of my life, I'm good with it. Maybe I can do something in here. So I started doing yoga and helping suicide people that had uh, tried to take their life. My last nine years, I sat as a suicide companion, four hours a day, uh, talking to people who had tried to take their lives. And that uh, is an amazing thing because you really, really start to understand how important empathy is in life. And, and it is probably the most profound knowledge on the planet is uh, empathy. That's a very selfless thing to be able to sit next to somebody and emotional too. That's intense. That's, uh, did you realize a lot about yourself when you did that as well? well a ton. Yeah. A ton. And um, it really helped me understand my, my true self. And that's amazing because we all can inspire not only ourselves, but others for real, mm -hmm. you, you know, an inspiration. I, did, I was just asked to be a keynote speaker in um, Mississippi. And I said, yeah, sure. They said, well, what would you speak about? I said, inspiration and magnificence. Well, we're talking about cannabis. <laughs> I, I said, yeah, listen, look at, look at whoever you're sitting by. You're mm -hmm. looking at inspiration right here because mm -hmm. we inspire ourselves and we all can inspire others. It's pretty cool. That is cool. That magnificence. I love that. That's a great word too, to lead it up. Uh, it's true. And, and to have you out now and to have you back into the, the system, man, you're like a, a prize, to be honest, man. Your story is inspiring to a lot of guys in this generation who 
know nothing about that. There's, you know, it's, I'm born in the eighties. So those are a couple generations. I, I feed off of stories like that, but the new generation, the guys that are coming up now, this feels like a long time ago and they need to realize like what's happening now isn't even on the scale of what was happening then. You know, it's, it's mind boggling to see where it was and where it's going now. It's changed so much in such that time, yeah, you know, corporate, uh, corporate mm. chats stepped into the picture a little bit and, yeah, huh? and uh, completely changed the atmosphere. Some maybe because uh, I know I'm, I'm talking and working with some people who uh, haven't even smoked weed yet. And, but yet they're, they're involved with a, whether it's an investment or, or whatever it is, they're mm. running a, a, a hundred thousand square foot grow. <laughs> crazy. It's crazy. I mean, and, and so then when you get out and you start to get involved in these projects, is everyone just immediately hitting you up or is no, it? I've been out for eight years. Okay. So my first four years, I worked in substance abuse treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a beh behavioral health technician and mentored and, and spoke with a lot of Afghanistan veterans coming back that uh, have opioid problems, addictions and alcohol addictions. So I get out of prison. And I get a job on the beach teaching yoga and meditation at sunrise. And I go, this is, this is so profound mm -hmm. because it's just where I'm supposed to be. It, it was amazing. So um, through those four years, I ended up really learning even more about myself. So now, um, just a couple of years ago, I started um, working with Freedom Grow in a, mm -hmm. uh, a larger capacity. And I, it's a funny story and a good story. So I'm in the joint and I get a letter from a big manila envelope with photos. I go to my cell, I open it up, and it's these beautiful women. And they got posters of, of me at a rally in Washington State and California and in front of the White House asking Obama to release me. I'm going, who the hell are these beautiful women? And it's a group, Freedom Grow. And uh, Amy Povo from Amy Can Do Foundations. And I'm going, man, this is a beautiful thing. They're advocacy. They're cannabis advocate people that wanted to support cannabis prisoners. Mm -hmm. And now I'm vice president of Freedom Grow. And it's just amazing to be able to help these families. And because you know, no one should be in jail for this plant. I mean, if you sold weed and you didn't pay your taxes, hey, the maximum you can get is five years. But please, uh, someone for five pounds of weed is going to get five years in prison don't make sense. No, um, and just because you live in a different state or across a, a line and, and it, everything's being treated different now. It's, it's, a, it's a crazy time because, I mean, you still go through Tennessee, you know, and certain, you know, Virginia, Georgia. Still go through certain places, and weed's not looked on very lightly. And then you come out to California, and you can go buy it all over the place for fifty. You know, what I'm saying it's crazy. It's cheap now. It is. It is. The markets. The last year, the market's gone crazy. It's yeah, been wacky, it. man. I just got a license in New Jersey, and it's completely different there than it is here with pricing. I'm like blown away. I mean, it's wholesaling at three thousand dollars a pound. Yeah, the the East Coast, especially like Northeast, they love fire and they don't they'll hunt down the good stuff. They don't mind paying. Yeah, they they've it's always been like that with them. Well, that's true with the, the the people that really like to smoke. Oh, yeah, it yeah is. I mean, yeah, they want what's good. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Uh, all that time, did you have a favorite strain? All the stuff you were bringing in, did you have one? Was there ever one where you're like, I, oh, I I'm really always like tie sticks? Okay, uh, I I like that. Um, I like some of the skunk, skunk weed I used to smoke. What about nowadays? What do you like smoking on? Is there anything specific or is it? I, whatever I'm smoking at the time. Yeah. <laughs> Just some good with sticky That's weed. I, I, uh, I'll smoke whatever I have, mm -hmm. but um, some OG Kush I like. Yeah, this one's nice. I, li I, like, either, I like the sour diesel. What was the adrenaline wise? Bringing in a hundred plus thousand pounds of weed or racing a car, which one's which one? Which one gave you more? Racing a car. Yeah, yeah. Just no. Uh, this last few weeks, this last four or five days, I've been at a racetrack in Lime Rock, Connecticut, in a rally, and got to take some race cars around the track, and that is by far um, as far as adrenaline and stuff mm -hmm. goes. Now coming through 
off the Gulf Stream of the Atlantic Ocean with a boatload of weed in the middle of the night. That's adrenaline, and it's it gets you pumped, mm-hmm. but also uh, hitting your marks and and at, being able to control the car, trying to anyway. That's uh, a little bit a little bit more adrenaline for me. Damn, the the one was crazy was when you you commissioned two cars to race because if one broke down, you'd be able to continue in the second. And that one race they showed on Netflix was it? You said I think your brother or one of your friends was driving the second car. He's my brother, but we're all brothers. Two car team. Uh, give me a little bit better shot at at um, if one car broke down, I'd have another one running. These are some endurance racing when you go mm-hmm. six hours and 12 hours and 24 hour races. Yeah, I saw that. And it's Miami raining and one of them, it was insane. I mean, if you haven't seen the Netflix special, I mean, I'm going to keep mentioning it because it was just, you're locked in for the foot. You're like, it's over. This is it. You want more. It literally needs to be a two hour movie. It's crazy. <laughs> well, I just sold the book so the, for a movie. So you'll be seeing a movie. That's awesome. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask is like, When that load comes in, what's your day look like? Even though they're unloading it, are you on the phone? Are you concerned? Are you worried? Or is it like just another day? I was on pay phones. All day. Yeah, we had beepers and pay phones. (laughs) No (laughs) cell phones. But actually, actually, right towards the end, we started getting the Motorola 2000s. So there was like the big bricks. So we did have those. Oh, shit. Okay. Uh, if you could go back and change one thing about your journey at that time, what would it be? Just one thing. If you could just change this one. I probably took the offer to drive for Ford Motor Company. I saw that. You turned it down because yeah. you want to keep your, your group together, your crew. Well, I had a load I was already working on, so I kind of leaned into leaning to go ahead and finish that project. Was it ever hash at the time or was it all just cannabis? Did you ever, was there any need to move hash or demand for hash? Uh, the, the hash in Colombia was the worst. Oh, oh okay. God. Yeah. So I would have had to go to Afghanistan and Nepal or someplace. I loved smoking the Nepalese finger hash. That was good hash. Ah, <laughs> that's awesome. But the one, the Colombia just didn't, they didn't no, have they, their tech that down. The hash was, was, was junk. Yeah. I, I always wanted, did they ever ask you like, so you, cause like most of the time with that much open space, they're like, why are you doing weed? Most people do Coke. Was there ever that question by the authorities? Like, no, not, they were like, okay, he's doing weed. Cause no, they never I, caught I had, it. So. I had people wanting to do Coke. Yeah. I can imagine people being like, you got this much space. What are you, what are you filling it with this for? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, that, that's what I always thought too. Cause I was like, man, uh, from guys I've heard, you know, through first smoke, that have told us stories. It's always like, you know, they couldn't believe I was moving weed. They thought it would have been this, you know? Well, I never talked to the authorities, so I don't yeah, know. <laughs> I mean, that's what's amazing about your journey. I don't know what journey. they got to say. I said, that, you have the best I shut journey. The fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So we never had a discussion. <laughs> I, that's the best way. I mean, your shit's all hearsay. That's amazing. Most people get busted red handed coming in, moving a little, you know, it's yours isn't like that. Uh, man, one of the things, I guess, uh, what do you miss most about smuggling? Is it the money or is it other things? Uh, just putting together an operation, but, um, actually I don't miss nothing from it. Um, uh, mm-hmm. for real, I'm, I'm like thrilled to be right here at this moment, right now here. I just, I'm, I'm blessed. So, um, miss nothing from my past at all. I just, uh, you know, we, we got what we got right here and that's a blessing and I'm just, I'm thrilled. That's awesome. Uh, Going forward, what what kind of project are you involved in? Obviously, you sold the book for a movie. Uh, what other type of uh, anything else it's we should Freedom Grow, right? Yeah, here. I'm, yeah. I'm working with Freedom Grow, a nonprofit, all volunteer organization that helps cannabis prisoners. If you haven't checked us out, check us out. Mm-hmm. You know, freedomgrow.org. Yeah. Um, I also do some brand ambassador work for a couple of companies. Um, they have brands out here. Um, Weedsy is one of the brands. Uh, you can get them them out here and dispensaries and country cannabis is another one a completely vertical operation and they just got into the california market um just recently so country cannabis it's really cool logo too mm-hmm. it's got like the marlboro man and he's like uh, he's got a joint in his hand and a big uh weed leaf behind him 
<laughs> it's a, it looks just like the Marlboro Man kind of, but with a weed leaf. That's hilarious. Yeah. I mean, country dude, cannabis. It makes you know. sense. And then, I mean, as you're going through the races and you're going through the race team, is it? I mean, those times it just seemed like things were man. It was a big party in Miami. South Florida yeah. was just taking we're, off. We're having a big party this weekend. We're doing in Temecula, uh, Bella, Florida, a golf uh, celebrity golf and tournament. Uh, it's pretty cool. In Temecula. In Temecula. That's awesome. Yes. And then what's it based around the, also the project you're involved in? We've been, Freedom Grow has been asked yeah. to be a, a charity, one of the three charities that they're giving to. So we're like super stoked over it. Uh, we're getting the world out and spreading the knowledge that, hey, there's still people, your brothers and your sisters still still locked up. And I say your sisters because it's not just dudes. Mm -hmm. We have a young lady, her husband and um her, him and his wife got caught with 50 pounds of weed. He got five years. She got six. She, he just got out about 40 days ago and she, she still has one year left. So it, they're still locking up people and it's sad. And it's our brothers and sisters that are locked up. And we ask people to please support us. I mean, come in, check us out. We're all volunteers and we just want to help these families. Yeah, it's cool that you're helping the family too. That's what you're focused on. It's like, yeah, help the person, but also the people who well, are without the person. Yeah, it's you know when you you see these people getting locked up, and you go, oh my God. But yet, when you look at it, the families are the victims because they're the ones suffering. They're separated from their loved ones, and they're going through a lot of drama and hardships too. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's like locking up the whole damn family, it, and it's for a flower. I mean, it, this shit's got to stop. Yeah, it is wild, man. So with the book, where do we find the book? The book you can find at Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble, or you can get it audio either way. Uh, check it out. It's a good story. And yeah, you'll yeah. see it in the movies coming up soon. And you know, check out freedomgrow.org. Yeah, I'm excited about that. I'm, I'm Honestly, I can't wait to read the book. Now that I've seen the Netflix series, and I know this is going to be a way more uh, deep dive into- Yeah, that's a much more yeah, deep dive than yeah. what Netflix has. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I mean, uh, the Netflix series and the movie is a must. I'm, I can't wait for this to drop. Any details about when the movie or what's about to happen? Or well, Yeah, we just, about two weeks ago, got a screenplay writer that joined the team. And just, well, that's what stage we're at now. So who might play who, uh, I, I, that's, not, that's not where we're at right yet. Mm -hmm. Probably within under four years, I would think. I don't think it's going to take you going to be pretty that. involved. Do you think? Uh, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. I mean, that's best best case scenario to have you on sets like back in the day, having like a you know when they would have like good fellas and they'd have some of the guys on. It's like you get the accurate no, I'm story. Be like hands on a lot. Yeah, man. Randy Lanier, one of the largest smugglers in U.S. history, who didn't get caught red handed. No uh, weed. It's amazing to think that. And then, for, then my brain went immediately to, oh, God, I hope I kept some of them seeds. <laughs> I swear to God. I, was, I yeah. kept thinking that like 10 yeah. times while I'm watching this documentary. I'm like, man. Yeah. You that has come across my mind, but. I you bet. In the hole of the ship. It's too late. Yeah. But man, first smoke of the day special, Randy Lanier, 660,000 pounds of cannabis brought into the US. And I'm sure that's even speculative about what it really was um you got to check out check out the netflix series check out the book check support out the, the book. man himself reach out to him check follow. out freedomgrow.org yep support us what about your instagram you on instagram i'm on instagram you can find me at randy lanier 27 27 years and you got blue thunder pre-rolls dropping i got i got some i'm working on a strain right now of blue thunder i'm not sure when that's going to be ready but uh, mm. it's coming Awesome. Got some other strains coming too for New Jersey. Octane Cannabis is the name of that. Man, so, tune in uh, and support the man himself. All you, you smugglers out there, reach out to the homie. <laughs> First smoke of the day, Black Leaf, Randy Lanier. Peace out. Yo, welcome to the Diamond Mine, the diamondmine.la, California source for boutique genetics, powered by yours truly, Black Leaf. And you know what that means? That means I'm bringing my best genetics into this. I'm bringing stuff I've been hiding, harboring away, stuff I haven't wanted to let out. We're bringing all that into the diamondmine.la and we're gonna offer that to California. Go on our website, hit the newsletter, and see if you could rock with us. 
Get on board with some of our genetics and change your garden. The Diamond Mine.LA, powered by Blackleaf.